Uh, we will now per, uh, move on to valedictory statements, and I'll call the leader of the government, Senator Cormann. Um, thank, thank you very much, um, Mr. President. Um, Mr. President, on each um, significant occasion for me in this chamber, from the moment I started sitting in that seat right at the back, the moment when I gave my first speech, every budget, my wife Hayley would be in the chamber with me, and that was always very special. Today, she would have liked to have been here, but we live in the sort of times where what seemed entirely straightforward when I first joined this chamber is not straightforward right now. Travel logistics between Perth and Canberra, which were straightforward for a very long time, are anything but. Um, in terms of flight connections, in terms of capacity to re-enter your own state after you come to a place like Canberra. So, sadly, my amazing wife, who's carried much of the burden um, for me being able to do this job over the last 13 and a half years, is not here today, and our two beautiful children, Isabel and Charlotte, are not here today. Um, so that is a small regret as I now approach, as I now start to give what is going to be my final speech uh, in this chamber. Mr. President, how good is Australia? <laughs> I, I know that in more recent times this uh, sentence has been uh, assumed by somebody more famous than me. But let me say that for as long as I've lived in Australia, from the moment I arrived here in 1996 as a migrant from Belgium, I have often said, how good is Australia? Because this is truly a country where if you, wherever you come from, whatever corner of the world, if you come here with the right attitude and uh, with um, uh, with, with an intention to have a go, work hard, do the best you can in whatever your chosen field of endeavor, there is really and truly no limit to what you can achieve in your chosen field of endeavor. And the proof is in the pudding here in the Senate. I mean, we've got a leader of the opposition and a leader of the government who are both first generation Australians from non-English speaking backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Mr. President, how good is Australia? I don't think that there would be any other country in the world where this would be possible. Mr. President, I have thoroughly loved my time in the Senate. I love this place. I mean, we come here with a whole diversity of perspectives, with different views, with different aspirations, and we represent many, many Australians with different views and aspirations. And in this chamber, we engage in the battle of ideas, we engage in political combat, uh, we, we engage in the personality contest every now and then. But in the end, this is a chamber where, on behalf of the nation, by engaging in that policy debate, we are able to achieve a consensus on the best way forward. And, you know, in that process, I've always been uh, a very enthusiastic participant, uh, both uh, in opposition and in government. I found it to be more fun in government, I've got to say. <laughs> <laughs> and I've <laughs> got to say, well, it's more fun in government. And, and you know, estimates, I mean, I sort of had interjection from the leader of the opposition, uh, uh, Mr. President. I think I might have to take a point of order here. Um, <laughs> my friend Penny. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, there's probably nobody in this parliament with whom I've sparred, uh, you know, more um, vigorously um, and engaged more vigorously in the political battle and the battle of ideas than Senator, ideas than Senator Wong. And yet, we do have a deep personal friendship, which I'm sure she won't mind me say publicly, and we do trust each other. I mean, how good is 
it to work that way, where you can not give an inch in terms of fighting for what you believe in, and, but also work with each other to find practical and pragmatic solutions where that is in the interest of the nation. And I know that, I mean, Senator Wong and I, that is always how we both have approached it, and I very much appreciate that um, about you. I mean, we've been on opposite sides uh, in Senate estimates for many, many years, first from opposition and then from government. I've got to say, I enjoy that better from government too. Um, <laughs> I, I've decided I'm more of a batsman than a bowler. <laughs> and, and, I'm, and I'm happy that I don't have to go back into a bowling session. <laughs> Mr. President, when I came here in uh, 1996, I never thought I'd end up in politics. I mean, you can't plan this. I mean, I thought I'd you know, go and work in a, in a law firm or uh, you know, in a business or whatever, and I tried to get a job um, you know, in Perth where I arrived. And you know, back in you know, the, the mid-90s, the legal fraternity in um, Western Australia was still comparatively protectionist in terms of the capacity of non English-speaking background or non-Australian educated um, law graduates to get into the legal profession. It, it, it intrigued me when years later uh, my wife Hailey started working at Clayton Utes in, in the sort of mid-2000s and people were bending over backwards to facilitate people through the process as quickly as possible from wherever they came and I sort of thought ten years ago, I mean I literally, I mean they said I had to go back to university for another two years after having done six years at university already. And that sort of didn't seem that appealing to me at the time. And so I, I ended up working um, as, a, as a staffer for a politician because that was the only immediately transferable skill where there wasn't any protectionism in place that I could deploy in the short term. Um, I mean, that was not necessarily all that straightforward initially either. I mean, there was a you know, former senator, Alan Eggleston, in 1996, um, advertised for an electorate officer and I applied for that job and I didn't even get an interview which I've reminded him <laughs> which I've reminded him of often since then and I thought like, there's got to be a, there's got to be a better way so I, I rang uh, the office of uh, you know, this uh, recently elected senator Chris Ellison who'd recently been made the chair of the treaties committee and I thought oh well um, treaties committee I've done some public international law I'm international um, treaty sounded international. I thought I'd go and have a meeting with him and see whether I can do some work for him as a volunteer. And <laughs> I think he was a bit intrigued when, I, when this, this uh, guy, I was young, skinny, black hair back then, <laughs> with a German accent, walked in and offered to work as a volunteer. But he took a chance on me and the rest, as they say, is history. I mean, that is how um, I first ended up in the Australian Parliament as a Belgian migrant in October 1996, 24 years ago. And like I've essentially been one way or the other uh, around this place ever since. And it's just been a, an, amazing, an amazing story and an amazing opportunity to contribute um, through like public, to contribute to public service uh, you know, through political service. Now we all come here with our um, own um, personal political and policy values and perspectives and um, my, some of my colleagues have heard me tell this story before but I think I have to put it on the record here and in fact my liberal national colleagues have heard me tell this story yesterday. The thing that really persuaded me to pursue um, the policy and political values um, that are, that are uh, pursued by the Liberal and National Parties uh, is uh, my experience as a student when I reflected you know, at the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall on the reason why a, a people who after the Second World War started with the same challenges, opportunities, context, climate, geography, why a people divided by different political and policy choices ended up in such fundamentally different positions when it came to their quality of life, their living standards, um, and, and the, the, the general opportunities for individuals, their families, and the communities in which they live. And really, I mean, the choices on the western side of the wall, on the western side of, on the, on the western side of Germany, 
was a choice to pursue policies that supported individual freedom, uh, free enterprise, reward for effort, encouraging people to stretch themselves, take risks, have a go, and all of that underpinned with a social safety net. Uh, they called it the social market economy, the soziale Marktwirtschaft. But the other thing that West Germany did, and that is also something that has always stuck with me, was they opened themselves up to the world, they engaged in open trade, they, they committed themselves to international competition, they committed themselves to be a, a, an outward-looking, globally focused, open trading economy. And that is where the economic miracle on the western side of Germany came from, that's where the Wirtschaftswunder uh, came from. Whereas on the eastern side, where you had uh, policy choices and a political system that focused on socialism and um, equality of outcomes, uh, which sort of ultimately led to the lowest common denominator um, focus, people ended up in comparative poverty. And you know, in the end, I mean, you know, the wall only was built in 1961. So from 1949, they were on different trajectories. By 1961, the wall had to be built to keep people on one side in the system because people didn't want to spontaneously stay there. And then 28 years later, even the wall wasn't enough to keep people in because ultimately, people have a thirst for freedom. And the wall came down. And, but it's the other thing that I learned was the power of the trajectory. Now, you know, commentators and political opponents at various times have laughed at me when I talk about the power of the trajectory. But think about this. Like, I mean, you might, I mean, the, the people of East Berlin wouldn't have noticed on day one or two or five that they were on a different trajectory to the people of West Berlin. But when you're on a different trajectory for 40 years and you're making bad choices as opposed to good choices, when you look back after 40 years, the destination you end up in can be fundamentally different. And some people have said, oh, well, that's because, you know, on one side it was a dictatorship and it was uh, an auth autocratic political system. And that's why people weren't enjoying the same living standards. That fails to understand what is cause and what is effect. The reason the system became more and more dictatorial and more and more autocratic was because they had to exercise more and more control on those people who didn't want to spontaneously live in a system that um, restricted their freedoms. And fast forward to Australia. I mean, Australia in the 1980s, in the era uh, post the Hawke and Keating governments, the Howard governments and subsequent governments leading all the way to the Morrison government now, since Australia has made a decision to open ourselves up to the world to be a, a, a globally focused, open, trading economy, we have gone from strength to strength. Our, we've gone through a period of nearly 30 years of continuous growth on the back of making the difficult decisions some 40, nearly 40 years ago of opening ourselves up to global competition. Yes, there have been difficult transitions and of course it wasn't all easy, but it has made Australia stronger, more prosperous and has given the Australian people better opportunities to get ahead and to have the best possible uh, living standards. And international competition can be uncomfortable. And you know, this is a debate that is taking place in the world now. I mean, it's, you know, there can be a temptation to say, wouldn't it be so much more comfortable if we protect ourselves from uh, global competition and if we put fences around various activities so that people don't have to um, worry about being challenged? The problem with that is, just by putting a fence around something, just by protecting something, doesn't mean that the innovation and the competitive forces elsewhere stop. All it means is that you lose touch with where the rest of the world is at. All it means is that you fall further behind. So as we work on getting out of this COVID recession, We've got to make sure as a nation that we continue to remember what has made us so strong over 30 years of continuous growth. And it, it has been a genuine commitment, which has been a bipartisan commitment, to Australia as a globally focused, open trading economy. And that has been over 30 years so far, and it will be in the future, be the best way for Australia to 
offer the best possible opportunities for Australians today and into the future to get ahead. Mr. President, um, during my time in uh, this chamber in opposition and in government, I've been involved in a whole series of policy battles and um, you win some, you lose some, uh, but I've always uh, been an enthusiastic and vigorous uh, contributor in those various uh, debates and battles. And I guess what I've, the other thing I've learned in this place is that sometimes uh, what you are able to stop um, can be as important as what uh, you are able to put in place. And, you know, one of the proud moments of my uh, career in, uh, was uh, to be able to put the detailed and forensic scrutiny over the anti-WI mining tax, yeah. uh, which um, I previous government uh, sought uh, to uh, impose, 99% of the revenue of which was going to come out of one jurisdiction and uh, it is a moment of great personal pride that we uh, were able to um, repeal that particular legislation on coming uh, into government. But of course, I mean I've always looked at, um, when in coming into parliament, I, I've always looked at the period in opposition as the training period to prepare you in the best possible way uh, to be able to make a meaningful contribution uh, in government if and when you get the opportunity to serve in government. And you know, in the Senate, I, I, I got to say, the Senate estimates process is an amazing way to be trained as a future contributor in executive government because uh, you get to know all the people, you get to know all the issues, and if you apply yourself to asking uh, you know, all of the possible questions, uh, it is an amazing way to get across a lot of details. And you know, it's, it's, it's the it's the ultimate um, on-the-job uh, university level training, um, I, I would say. And so on coming uh, into government in 2013, you know, and looking back since 2013, I am proud that as a government we have been able to repair the budget uh, to the point where by 2018-19 a great budget, the 2018-19 budget, uh, Prime Minister, uh, where by the, by the time of 2018-19 uh, we had returned the budget back into balance. We have, over the period between 2013 and 2023, prior to the coronavirus crisis hitting us, we, we had passed and implemented uh, budget bottom line improvements to the tune of $250 billion. So what that means is the bottom line would have been $250 billion worse off over that period if we hadn't made the decisions and hadn't legislated the decisions that we've put forward in uh, various budgets. Now I've been involved in seven budgets, seven half yearly budget updates, uh, eight final budget outcomes, a couple of pre-election economic and fiscal outlooks and though <laughs> that is a pretty involved process. I mean, every budget, every half yearly budget update, Simon, you'll find out, <laughs> it's, um, it's a lot of meetings uh, in rooms without windows, it's a lot of paper, papers to read through, it's a lot of conversations with colleagues, it's a lot of um, conversations within the Expenditure Review Committee with a view of trying to make the best possible decision for the future of Australia. Now, and, and it's a fine balance. You want to make decisions to allocate resources where that is appropriate, as much as necessary, as little as possible. Uh, Simon, uh, you want to uh, make sure that um, the expenditure is effective in, in achieving uh, the uh, policy objective that you're pursuing um, as a government. Um, but you also are always very mindful that if we, um, if we, if we don't get this prioritization right, there are real consequences for real people. And so, in, in particular in this year, 2020, as we were hit with the coronavirus crisis and we had to make some of the decisions on uh, things like JobKeeper, JobSeeker and, 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 and so on, I mean, we were very, very, very conscious and it was, it was mentally and emotionally really a, a, quite a heavy burden 
to, to really think through what this uh, meant uh, for, for real people. Over this period, my, uh, the uh, successful legislation of personal income tax cuts in 2018 and 2019 to the value now of $350 billion, putting more money into workers' pockets, helping to stimulate the economy and generate growth by boosting aggregate demand. That is you know, one of my personal highlights in terms of legislation going through the Senate during this period. I mean, it was quite hotly contested the first two times. It was comparatively easy today. Um, to bring uh, these um, income tax cuts forward, various savings bills. One, one of the things I just want to reflect on, and this is something where the coalition and the Greens came together, Senate voting reforms. Before we, before we reformed the Senate voting systems, there was this lottery where uh, somehow uh, the 97 per cent of people who voted one above the line immediately lost control of their preferences, and those preferences were traded by so-called preference whisperers who were doing deals behind closed doors which weren't transparent at all. And the reforms that we passed were reforms that empowered voters to not only determine where their first preference goes if voting above the line, but also where their second, third, and subsequent preferences would go above the line. Uh, so instead of having people uh, get um, elected into the Senate with very low number of votes, whatever our views on the views of individual senators represented in this, in, in this chamber. Now, the people who are here are here because a sufficient number of Australians backed them in. And they are here because they reflect the views and aspirations of a sufficient number of Australians, not because of some accidental um, lottery based on a backroom uh, deal. And, you know, 40 hours of debate, including one through the night, um, from I think we started on a Thursday afternoon at 4.30, 5 o'clock, and we went to 2 o'clock the next afternoon straight. And the Labour Party was running a roster against me. <laughs> With um, every, every hour, I think we had, uh, we had quorum calls and we had uh, you know, mo like, um, motions to uh, suspend the Senate, and <laughs> everybody turned up. And this is where I've got to say, what a fantastic team uh, I've had the privilege to work with here in the Senate. Uh, you know, we've, we've been involved in many battles for the nation, and we've, we've won many good battles for the nation that will put Australia on a stronger foundation trajectory for the future for some time uh, to come. Um, I'm proud of my work, which is perhaps not as well known, but Senator Wong knows about, uh, the uh, Australian-Germany Advisory Group. Uh, one of the jobs I was given by uh, Prime Minister Abel in uh, 2000 and 14 at the G20 Leaders Summit when we had a bilateral meeting with Chancellor Merkel was to co-chair this group, the Australia-Germany Advisory Group, uh, to explore ways to broaden, deepen and strengthen the bilateral relationship with Germany. Now, you know, Germany, uh, the biggest economic power in Europe, the fourth biggest economic power in the world, um, we had friendly relations. But we didn't really, we weren't really top of mind with each other. It was a very long distance. And I mean, Germany is a very important economy in Europe, and Europe is a very important economy, and perhaps one that historically we accessed primarily, primarily through uh, the United Kingdom because of obvious historical uh, ties. But the work that we did to strengthen our relationship with Germany and with France and, and with other countries on the continent will stand us in good stead moving forward as we now are pursuing a trade agreement separately with uh, the European Union and with the United Kingdom post uh, the um, Brexit vote in the UK. I'm going to go just quickly mindful of time and not wanting to hold everybody up for too long. But at a WI level, other than being able to um, get rid of the mining tax, you know, GST reform and the reform of GST sharing arrangements, making sure that we delivered a fairer, better deal for Western Australia. Uh, in a way that was good for the country, that encouraged and facilitated stronger national growth and was also good for every other state because we uh, calibrated the uh, arrangement such that no other state was worse off. In fact, states were better off. And that is, that is a real credit uh, to uh, Scott Morrison as treasurer uh, who worked with his uh, liberal colleagues from WI and who, who worked really hard and really smart to come up with a creative way of delivering the outcome and the people of Western Australia will be forever grateful uh, for the work you did uh, there, Prime Minister. And let me say, 
Um, the West Australian state government, my, my good friend, uh, the treasurer of Western Australia, Ben White, uh, delivered his budget in Western Australia yesterday, and he delivered a $1.2 billion surplus. $1.2 billion surplus. Not bad in a pandemic, I guess. Um, but you know how much the GST top-up payment uh, is as a result of our reforms this financial year? $1.5 billion. So a $1.2 billion surplus and a $1.5 billion GST top-up payment, uh, courtesy of the Morrison reforms to the GST sharing arrangements. So I mean, that puts it very starkly, I thought. With my colleagues, I've also been proud to have been able to uh, help deliver a, a fair share of um, in federal infrastructure funding for the great state of Western Australia. I want to just now turn to the marriage law, law postal survey for a moment, if, if you don't mind. For the entire period that I've been uh, in this parliament, um, the issue of um, marriage equality kept popping back up, it, it, and it was never resolved. And it became increasingly divisive in the community, and there was clearly a very strong push to resolve this issue uh, and to uh, get it dealt with once and for all. And across the Australian community, there was, among good, reasonable, good Australians, a diversity of views, which was not easily reconcilable. Good Australians can legitimately have a different perspective on this, and we needed to find a way to resolve this issue once and for all for the nation in a way that kept the nation together. And I know there was a big push that this should just be dealt with by a vote in Parliament without consulting the Australian people. Let me tell you, I am proud for the role that I've been able to play to facilitate the effective, professional conduct of the Australian Marriage Law Postal Service through the IBS, which did an outstanding job in helping to deliver it. The result is there, was there for all to see, and the result, I believe, helped achieve that reform in a way that had public support. If the Parliament had imposed this on the Australian people, there would have always been one side of the community that would have resented that change having been imposed. Having made that decision the way we have, the reform was achieved, but in a way that kept the nation together. Mr. President, <laughs> this has been an amazing opportunity to serve my country, the country that I chose to make my home. All of us come here with the support of a whole range of different people, but fundamentally our parties select us and the people vote for us at elections. I, I would like to thank the West Australian Liberal Party for the trust they have put in me, a non-English speaking background a migrant who had been in the country for less than 11 years at the time. I promised that I would give it my best. I hope that you agree that I have. When I got here, um, I was here at the tail end of the Howard government and I just thought, wow, this is just amazing. How, how did I end up in this party room with John Howard? I mean, absolute giant. I mean, and somebody that I deeply admired. But then, we went through a period in opposition. Brendan Nelson, fine Australian, great Australian. Uh, Malcolm Turnbull, with whom I had a very good personal and working relationship. Much has been written, but I think the Prime Minister would agree. Peter Dutton, my friend Peter Dutton would agree, that during the period of his leadership, we all worked very hard to help make him the most successful Prime Minister he could possibly be. And a lot of good things were achieved during that period. A lot of good things were achieved during that period. Tony Abbott, who nearly won the election for us in 2010, worked so hard, who did win the election in 2013, like obviously a man of strong convictions and who first put me into the cabinet. Uh, I will forever be grateful for the opportunities that he's given, given me. Scott Morrison. Scott and I, we are very close friends. 
we have worked together exceptionally well. So don't believe all of the stuff that you read in the media. We are very, very good friends. Mm -hmm. And yes, we engage in debates on policy. And we don't always agree. Newsflash, in politics, you look at issues and you have ideas on the best way forward and how to resolve things and you, you sort of in, with the overlay of your political values and, and from time to time you have different perspectives and you, the debate that you engage in brings you to a better way forward. And that is actually the way this system is meant to work. That is the way the expenditure review committee is meant to work, the cabinet is meant to work. The reason cabinet discussions are confidential is so that you can openly engage and robustly engage in this sort of debate because that is how you end up with the best possible decisions for your country. And it is true that Scott and I on occasions have had robust conversations on policy. But we've always been close and trusted friends you know, in this endeavor as we seek to achieve the best outcomes for our nation. And let me say, as I'm leaving this place, I'm feeling comfortable in the knowledge that Scott Morrison is leading a strong and united and cohesive team. The, the strongest, most united and most cohesive team that I've been a part of since I've been in this parliament on our side of politics. And so, uh, you know, as I become citizen Corman, uh, Prime Minister, I wish you and your government all the very best uh, in, into the future. I also want to thank Bridget, Senator McKenzie, as leader of the Nationals. Um, you know, again, we are two different parties and from time to time we have different perspectives on different issues, and, but we've always worked together exceptionally well and you know, with the, the right sort of overall attitude and commitment to finding solutions and I really very much thank you for the way you have engaged with me. In fact, I would like to thank all of my um, Liberal National colleagues for having supported me through my endeavours. Um, I would like to thank every senator in this chamber. I, I have thoroughly enjoyed engaging with all of you and I thoroughly respect and value the work you do for our nation. Um, I, I, it is your job to go hard for what you believe in. It is your job to engage in the debates that you engage in and I know that you will continue to, to do so. And let me just say uh, Penny, I do hope that we'll stay in touch even uh, when after we've left uh, this, this place. Crossbench, I've had a great diversity of uh, people on the crossbench over the years. Steve Fielding, Nick Xenophon, Glenn Lazarus, um, um, Senator Lambie, uh, Senator Roberts, Senator Hansen, you know, of course, you know, all our good friends in the Greens over the years with Senator Bob Brown was the leader when I got here, Senator Milne, Senator Di Natale and now of course Senator Waters. Um, I have always you know, sought to find a way to find common ground even when that initially appeared somewhat impossible. Um, you know, Senator Patrick is, you know, <laughs> knows how persistent I can be in trying to find common ground. Um, and I, I really, I, I thank all of you, Senator Lionham, Senator Dye, there's been quite a, quite a long list of different, um, different crossbench perspectives over the years. But let me say, it's been such a privilege to work with every single one of you and I, I will be watching you from a distance and, um, and um, wishing you all the best. I've also had, I've been very, I've been blessed with the great staff that I've had during my time in, uh, in office. Slide, Senator Slide Brockman was my chief of staff in opposition for most of my period in opposition and um, we've done some great things together and you know, here he is, he's now making his uh, own contribution in his own right and he's doing a magnificent job in particular across uh, regional Western Australia. I've had three chiefs of staff in government, Simon Atkinson who's gone to better and higher things but made an outstanding contribution in my office during my first three years as finance minister and an exceptional public servant um, and I'm sure that uh, he has got much further to go uh, under governments of either persuasion and I wish you very well. Uh, Belinda Pola, um, 
uh, an outstanding uh, professional uh, who uh, decided to go back to Queensland to have a family but uh, made a great contribution in my office for quite some time. And Chris Brown, uh, who I think is here somewhere. Ah, at the back, yeah. Who, who has held the fort for some time now. Um, I, I first, saw, um, I mean, he doesn't know this, but I first picked him as a future staffer when I first saw him at a young liberal function in 2008. I thought, this guy is talented. And, uh, and then by 2015, there was an opportunity and I snatched him. And uh, he's, done a, he's done a great job um, in my office. I, I just, it's hard to go through, I don't want to go through a whole shopping list of um, names, and I hope that my other very hard-working staff members will forgive me, but just limiting, limiting it to a few. But um, Natasha Lobo, my EI in Perth, has worked with me. You know, she, I first hired her in 1997, and she's been with me in my uh, WI Senate uh, office for the entire period. Um, just an amazing support and amazing loyalty over so many years. And of course, uh, Karen Wu, who has worked for seven years as the senior media advisor in government, and I mean, that's a tough job. Um, and so thank you very much for your service over that time. And Philippa Campbell, who um, is, uh, she, she came to me after a long period in um, Peter Costello's office, and so she knew a lot of um, what I needed to know when I started in this job and has been an amazing support. Secretaries in my department, I had the privilege of being the minister for the best department in the Commonwealth. Prime Minister, finance is the best department in the Commonwealth. Simon, finance is the best department in the Commonwealth. You're, you're close enough to the centre without being right at the centre. Like, you're, you're close enough to being able to help shape the decisions and the directions without being entirely on the front line. Um, and you've got a group of professionals in the department that are just outstanding. And I mean, David Tune uh, was there to settle me in uh, when, when I arrived, and I did know him out of the estimate spirit. Um, and, you know, he, he was very generous to me in sort of, I guess, teaching me the ropes as a new minister initially. Uh, Jane Holton, uh, the formidable Jane Holton, um, like, uh, you know, deployed all of her energy and uh, passion to, uh, you know, taking me to another level. And Rosemary Huxtable, um, just an amazing uh, world-class public servant. Um, it's been such a privilege to work with you over the entire period. Rosemary was the Deputy Secretary uh, Budget in Finance when I arrived, um, and we did our first few budgets uh, from, from that position, and in more recent years uh, became the Secretary of, of the Department. And, um, you know, Rosemary, I really value the work uh, that we've been able to do together to help put our nation on the best possible foundation and trajectory for the future. I would also like to thank the clerks who, in opposition in particular, have been so helpful in boosting my training to give the government of the day at the time the hardest possible time. And you know, all of the tricks that I learned in opposition from the clerks um, I, knew, I knew how to defend myself against when we were in government, which was fantastic. Not always, but you know, perhaps a bit better than I otherwise might have. The, ch the chamber attendants here who are always unfailingly courteous. Uh, I mean, this has been just such a great workplace. And I mean, everybody just makes a tick in such a nice and friendly and courteous fashion. But I would like to finish by firstly thanking uh, my parents for the opportunity they've given me as a child growing up. I'm not your typical liberal background politician. I mean, my parents are working class. My mum was a full-time mum. My dad was a factory worker. He got sick. He ended up on a, a disability pension. Like, we had four, they had four kids. Um, by the time they were 28, uh, it wasn't sort of plain sailing, but they bent over backwards to give me opportunity, and for that, I will forever be grateful. And I would like to say, I, I would like to finish by saying a very sincere thank you to Hailey. Hailey is an outstanding woman. She's an amazing individual. She's 
obviously my life's partner and best friend. She's an amazing mother to our beautiful children, Isabel and Charlotte. But she's an outstanding professional woman with a distinguished career in her own right. I mean, she was the president of the Law Society in WI at age 35. And I'm so proud of what Hailey has achieved now working at the bar in Perth and to observe the respect in which she's held by her colleagues and her peers in that profession. And Hailey had to build her career throughout that entire period while I was mostly away. During the seven years as finance minister, I was essentially over East every week from the middle of January to the middle of December, every week. And, you know, we had two kids. Hailey had her own career. I was over here. So she has carried a, a very substantial burden for me being able to uh, pursue this opportunity and provide to do this job. And I, I will forever be grateful for that. Um, thank you very much, Hailey. So colleagues, this is my last contribution uh, from this chair in this uh, chamber. There's probably more that I could or should have said, but uh, I think the hour is uh, advancing. Um, I give you this uh, commitment. After today, I won't be back. <laughs> Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, well, I rise on this, the valedictory of my friend and colleague, Matthias Cormann, uh, and wish to say a few words personally, but also on behalf of the Labor Party as he leaves uh, this chamber. When Matthias announced his intention to resign, I put out a statement in which I said, he was a formidable opponent, a trusted counterpart, and a parliamentarian of the old school. So I'm going to go through those briefly. First, we'll start with formidable opponent. When I was a minister, you see, I'm not from WA, so I didn't sort of engage with him on the plane, etc. First thing I remember about um, Matthias, I was kind of engaged in climate policy, which was not the easiest ministerial job to start with. Um, was this bloke with a German accent who kept asking me questions, started asking me questions and then started following me around at estimates. Not in a stalking sense, but in turning up, in turning up to estimates. I said, who is this bloke? Anyway, we did have a, a quite a lot, at, lot of interchanges at estimates. Um, he subsequently said to me when he became a minister and he wasn't answering questions that he'd learnt a lot about how not to really answer the questions from me when I was a minister, but I think that is a vicious, vicious calumny, uh, definitely untrue. Um, our combat has been pretty hard at times. Um, uh, I think uh, it's generally not been personal or churlish. He did once try calling me Australia's worst finance minister. I pointed out to him that my net debt was lower, my gross debt was lower, my tax to GDP ratio was lower. Uh, and uh, he didn't keep going with it, although he keeps going occasionally with uh, the same sort of exaggerated position that the coalition had to put in place to justify the 2014 budget. Uh, but notwithstanding the results of this budget, I'm not going to return the favour of the moniker. So, <laughs> I don't think that's a practice we should continue. Um, I knew he was a. I didn't know Matthias well when we were in uh, government. He was in opposition, um, and but I do remember one rather untoward uh, event at Estimates where I realised he must be a reasonably decent man. And I don't wish to embarrass the particular other senator, but I got meowed at in Estimates and got quite a bit of media. He, Blokes subsequently apologised and that we all moved on, but I just remember Matthias sitting there, just almost with his hand in his mouth, not saying anything, and I thought, well, maybe this bloke is actually decent. Um, <laughs> I described him as a trusted counterpart. He is. 
he's a decent man, and he's an honourable man. Uh, I'm sure he would be the first to say he's made mistakes at times. But I don't think between us we have ever breached a confidence. Uh, and we have always sought to honour our commitments to each other. I have valued that greatly. There's not many people about whom you can say that in politics. Uh, and it has been a, um, a great something I have valued greatly. I also described him as a parliamentarian of the old, of the old school. I just want to talk briefly about what I meant when I said that. The first is, I think, and we saw it again today in his contribution, though I noticed he didn't acknowledge the German Social Democratic Party and his, our sister party in his contribution about the war, but leaving that aside, um, he has a belief in democracy. And a belief in democracy is more than just words. It's a respect for institutions. It demands a respect for norms and conventions a respect for this parliament. And Matthias brings that to his job. Sometimes I think he, as I said yesterday, should have answered more questions. Or, but he does understand that as much as our constitution and our history, our democracy depends on what we do here and how we behave here. I think one thing we share is a belief in the importance of containing conflict. Now, that might sound to those opposite a little odd coming from Penny Wong, <laughs> but it's actually so important. Politics is, as some have said, war by other means. It's what we do to resolve conflict. We don't have revolutions. We don't get out guns. We don't become vigilantes. We fight here. Uh, and there must be limits. There must be limits. There must be containment. Because conflict without any limit risks destroying too much, risks damaging the polity, the people, the community, the institution too much. And that is one thing uh, I think Matthias and I have shared, an understanding of what we wanted to fight about, but what we wanted to make sure we, we, we didn't fight about. Some of those limits are set by our, our democratic traditions, by a democratic system, by norms, conventions. Some of them should be set by decency. Things like the, you know, the limitations around personal attacks, an understanding that disengagement is sometimes required, and on some issues that we shouldn't be partisan. And there are many um, examples I could give of times where I think regardless of our very different views on some issues, where we would have conversations which were about we need to make sure there's bipartisanship on this, we need to make sure there's a limited conflict on this. Um, one of them that I remember, because it meant a lot to me because of my history and my experience of racism when I was young, was after the phrasing Anning comments. And people might recall we had a bipartisan Motion, and I remember ringing uh, Matthias from out the back next to the kids' trampoline, um, and I said, "It would be really good if we could move this together. This motion, it would say something. But there's a lot of conflict, and we can do a lot of people can do a lot of politics about it. But you know, people need to hear a defence of multiculturalism and the assertion of inclusion from us both." It's not the only thing we've worked on uh, together. Some of the things I'm on a bound to keep between us. <laughs> but it, it, it was important. And um, you heard Matthias start today with, or Senator Cormann start today with a, um, a discussion about us both having um, a migrant background, him, him much more, much later in life, obviously. Um, but I think that has informed some of what we understand to be outside of the zone of desirable conflict in a democracy. Um, I will uh, miss our contest. 
I'll miss our catch-ups and the very good red wine. I'll miss our friendship, although I too hope we uh, maintain that beyond this. I'll miss sharing photos and stories of our children across the table during question time. I want to acknowledge your contribution to the nation and to the parliament. I wish more of it had been in opposition. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, want to say to Hayley, um, I want to thank Hayley for her contribution to the nation, but also that I reckon he's been pretty lucky and he's got a lot better um, um, for, uh, with your influence. Um, to Isabel and Charlotte, um, you know, it's wonderful you know, to have your father back in a different way. Um, so uh, I wish you well personally for all that lies beyond uh, and thank you uh, for your friendship and for your contribution. Thank you. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. And I too rise uh, this afternoon. Uh, with both enormous respect and uh, a touch of sadness, uh, to pay tribute to my friend and colleague, Senator the Honourable Matthias Cormann. Uh, more than 12 years ago, when I entered this place, I took up my place beside you as a fellow senator for the great state of Western Australia. Uh, now I stand here today contributing to your valedictory, and I can genuinely say that over the years in this place, you have been a true friend, and I thank you for both your friendship and your steadfast representation of the values that you and I hold so dear. Matthias, in your more than 13 years in this place, uh, you have left a mark that few others will ever emulate. Your achievements in this place and your service to our nation's wellbeing will have an impact for decades to come. Your legacy will be enduring. Uh, colleagues, in Matthias's maiden speech in 2007, he said this. This is a country where, if you put your shoulder to the wheel, work hard, embrace the people and values, and become an integral part of the community. In short, if you have a go, there is no limit to what you can achieve in a chosen field of endeavour. We all come to this place with a commitment to make a positive difference. Other than our energy and our enthusiasm, we bring to the table our background, our experiences and our values. And Matthias, yours is without a doubt a great Australian story, and one that should inspire anyone from any background who wants to succeed. You came here as an immigrant in your 20s. You embraced your new home. You've made a valuable contribution to our country through an incredible amount of hard work. 25 hours a day, eight days a week. That's just how you work. But it is this commitment and determination and I think my colleagues will agree when I say, no matter how frustrating for the rest of us when we receive a text from you at midnight on a Sunday <laughs> and you expect a timely response, uh, it is that commitment and dedication uh, that has seen you succeed in everything you do. Over our last few months, as our nation has faced the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, as Finance Minister, you as part of the team knew what needed to be done to provide the support to drive the economic recovery. Uh, your work as our finance minister, as the Prime Minister himself has stated, for seven years saw our nation enter COVID-19 in a far stronger position than what it was. It therefore allowed us to bring forward initiatives such as the JobKeeper payment, the JobKeeper supplement, the Supporting Apprentices and Trainees initiative and the many, many other initiatives which will help our economic recovery. For me, it is a personally bittersweet moment that you are leaving this place. I am so pleased for your new opportunity as Australia's candidate for the Secretary General of the OECD. You will make, if elected, an incredibly valuable contribution, not only to promote growth but also opportunity across the globe. As a fellow Western Australian Liberal Senator, we have been a united team since that meeting back in 2006. It was 7am and we met at the then famous Bar One on St George's Terrace in Perth for breakfast and, as Matthias liked to call it, a chat. That chat, though, ultimately changed the course of both of our lives. And here we are in 2020. 
I can honestly say that supporting you in your pre-selection was one of the best decisions I've ever made. And we've had our backs ever since. And in fact, colleagues, every year since I was elected, uh, many of you will know that Matthias and I have held the Cormann Cash Annual State Council Christmas Function. This year we hold our 13th and our final. And boy, it will be a big night. Uh, Matthias, your achievements in this place are extensive. You have been an effective senator, passionately representing the interests of our great state. You may not have been born in Western Australia, but you are without a doubt a sand groper, through and through. It was your leadership of our WA team and your constant advocacy that ensured Western Australia did get a fair deal and now gets a fair deal when it comes to DST distribution. And uh, all of the WA team, many of whom have joined us here today, uh, were proud to stand and fight with you. For many years to come, this is something that our great state will not forget and it will continue to have a positive impact in Western Australia. In your leadership roles, you have well and truly mastered this place, as Senator Wong herself acknowledged, whether it was working behind the scenes with colleagues within the government, reaching out and working with the opposition, the crossbench and the Australian Greens. When it comes to your role as finance minister, there is no question that you have consistently followed the principles you laid out in your maiden speech of free enterprise, individual freedom, personal responsibility, reward for effort, low taxation, less regulation and incentives for people to stretch themselves and to reach their full potential. The reason you are so successful is your incredible work ethic and the fact that, again, as Senator Wong herself articulated, you treat all senators regardless of their political affiliation with respect. In your maiden speech to this place, you also said, politics at its best is a noble profession. It is a noble pursuit. And in your case, history will record that you have carried yourself with great nobility. As we all know, it is often said that one of the greatest achievements in politics is to leave at a time of your choosing and on your own terms. And my friend, you are doing exactly that. You leave this place with an outstanding record of service and an achievement to undertake a new opportunity to serve both our nation and the world. Matthias, we will all miss your contribution in this place, and I will certainly miss you as a colleague and a friend. I wish you all the best in your next chapter, but in particular, as Senator Wong said, uh, with Hayley. Charlotte and Isabel. And I conclude by saying farewell, good and faithful servant of Western Australia and indeed Australia generally. Matthias, my friend, thank you. Senator Mackenzie. Thank you very much, Mr President. And um, I rise as leader of the Nationals in the Senate and join everybody here in the fact that it's a valedictory and we've still got uh, the stands packed, I think, is a testament to the man whose valedictory um, we're participating in today. You are so patriotic, Matthias, for your adopted nation. You're a senator's senator, and you know we want to make sure that there's more of those around. Um, your contribution to the parliament, to the coalition, and to our nation has been significant, and I'm looking forward to it continuing um, in another role. You've been leader in the government, um, leader of the government in the Senate since 2017. It's been my great honour, as deputy leader of the Nationals, to sit in that leadership group heading in to the 2019 election, and again to have worked with you uh, post-election as the leader of the Nationals. And I think it's your integrity, uh, your trust, your value system that has allowed, and your sense of humour at times, and your patience. Um, to really mean that we can get the results um, that we need, that we need to. Um, national, former national leaders Warren Trust, Barnaby Joyce, uh, current DPM Michael McCormack, uh, have all spoken highly about working with you in their their former roles. And as has Nigel Scallion, another Senate leader you've worked with, and Nashi. I spoke to Warren Trust, former Deputy Prime Minister, uh, earlier today, and he uh, was unequivocal. He believes you're the most outstanding finance minister that we've seen. Your attention to detail, the fact that you're across your brief, 
um, and that you approach negotiations rationally, calmly and reasonably. You don't always win, he said, with Matthias, but you know you've had a fair hearing. And so thank you for the work that you do that. Whether negotiating the fuel excise or championing our live uh, export and mining sector, the National Party uh, and Senator Cormann saw eye to eye on many, many issues. Uh, and I think it's his rock solid commitment as a true coalitionist. Can't say that about everybody in the Liberal Party, but for Matthias Cormann, a true coalitionist, uh, because he understands that together the Liberal Party and the National Party provide a strong, stable government uh, for our nation, uh, and that's the best, best outcome in the national interest. The mining sector that you championed for WA just wasn't for WA, and we Nationals uh, want to thank you for your um, attention to that. It all, it's sage advice to always pay attention to the smartest guy in the room. He can be your friend and supporter or not. <laughs> and it's always best, I think, and Senator, you always display um, a commitment to try and be the former. Your unwavering commitment um, to bettering the lives of all Australians, and I think you spoke earlier about um, your upbringing and, and what role that's played in the value system and the worldview that you've brought to this place, and I think we are all the richer for hearing that here. Um, you've, been, you've been a rock-like figure for the coalition ever since you've come to parliament, and we are going to severely miss you. Um, we mentioned estimates briefly. Uh, what I love about watching Matthias in estimates, and again, it's like being schooled. Um, he's got an army of public servants. Every, every seat behind him is taken up. Rosemary's there. She's got all the folders. Um, but he takes every question, and he can answer them. He's across the detail. And that is exactly how this process is meant to work. And it is an incredible privilege to watch you um, on FPA. We're X generations. I do want to share, you know, when some of those late night sittings um, with former Senator Fifield, Cashy, <laughs> Parry. Um, we had some good tunes. Uh, it was uh, all good fun. But I think, Matthias, what you have brought here has provided, I think, um, in my experience, some of the great moments of, of this chamber. And Penny mentioned, Senator Wong mentioned one earlier. It is both of your ability to come together on really key significant moments, um, such as around racism. That was one of the most powerful moments I think this chamber has ever seen, and it was a great privilege to be able to sit here and see both of you. So be proud of our nation for sending you both, and then proud of you both as individuals uh, for giving us as senators that moment in our nation. Um, so yes, you do show us what this chamber is capable through that. And I think, Matthias, your commitment as a senator's senator to the traditions and values of this chamber. Um, and you've got a partner uh, in, in this Leader of the Opposition that has helped you to um, fulfil that. I'm just going to recite a poem um, at the moment. I'm nearly finished. Uh, that I think describe, may describe Matthias's approach to poli politics. Um, Panic bells, it's red alert. There's something here from somewhere else. The war machine springs to life, opens up one eager eye, focusing it on the sky, where 99 red balloons go by. <laughs> 99 Decision Street, 99 ministers meet to worry, worry, super scurry. Sounds like budget prep. Call the troops out in a hurry. That's the cell. Uh, this is what we've waited for. This is it, boys. This is the war. The president's on the line as 99 red balloons go by. He is a coalition to, coalitionist to the core, and that requires true respect and mutual appreciation that there are two independent parties here, Matthias, and that is the key to your success in that role, and I look forward to working with Bermo uh, to that end. It is also your pragmatic and rational approach to policy decisions. When you stood up in your first speech as a fresh-faced newcomer in August 2007 and you thanked the then President, uh, President Ferguson from South Australia, for his advice and wisdom, I'll lift a few lines from that young Western Australian senator. Thank you for the advice and wisdom that you've shared with me in the time that we've sat in this chamber. I very much appreciated the generosity 
towards me as a new senator and me as a leader. And in more recent times, I'm sincerely grateful to have the privilege to work alongside you. I've always admired your passion, your commitment to our Liberal and National Party coalition, and respect you, your directness in standing up for what you believe in and bring those values here uh, as a conviction politician. All the best. Now I'm going to try not in German, but bon chance uh, for the next chapter. Senator Waters. Mr. President, and I rise on behalf of the Australian Greens to acknowledge Senator Cormann and his uh, work and enormous contribution to this place over many, many years. Having only recently stepped into the role of leader in the Senate for the Greens and in a year when we've all uh, been here less than we otherwise would, I've not had the opportunity to engage with you closely. Uh, our, po our politics are poles apart, but across the political spectrum you're seen as a straight talker, no nonsense, someone who is extremely bright across your brief uh, and always um, working very, very hard. You're also praised as a strong neg negotiator, much as we sometimes don't like the outcomes that you negotiate. Uh, our chamber will certainly miss someone so erudite that they can respond in multiple languages at the drop of a hat, as you did yesterday. Um, I must say I won't miss you rejecting the premise of my questions, <laughs> uh, but I do respect your conviction and your work ethic. Uh, I've also been in touch with uh, former uh, Greens leader Senator Richard Di Natale, who asked me to pass on some sentiments from him. Richard said that despite having very different political philosophies, you had his respect and his trust. He wishes you the very best in your next phase of life and assures you that you won't regret it. Um, as a senator and uh, a minister from Perth, with all the travel that that, that, that entails, uh, I'm sure that you'll enjoy some extra time with your family, very well earned, and your words about your family were very touching. We wish you all the very best. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, uh, in adding to the many fine words said about our friend and colleague, Senator Matthias Cormann, I want to focus on just a few brief points. Matthias, you leave here with a number of attributes that very few people carry out of this place at the very end of their time of service. You leave with respect and admiration, I think, as we are hearing from friend and foe alike in the political context. And that is something that is a testament to the way in which you have engaged, as we have heard from so many. You leave also with achievement and legacy. You have not just served time in this place, you have achieved outcomes. And for those outcomes, you can leave with a sense of pride. Your family can have pride that the sacrifice has been worthy. And our government and our side of politics and the nation should have thanks for what it is that you have achieved in that time. You have also demonstrated drive to the very absolute final moment of your service in this chamber. Uh, you are not one uh, who has put his feet up towards the end, as any of us who have been in receipt of those text messages this week have known, as anyone who was involved in the preparation of the budget this week uh, would have known, uh, you have been there driving relentlessly, ruthlessly where necessary, right through. We arrived in this chamber together just a few weeks apart as uh, senators each filling casual vacancies in those final few months of the Howard government. And we've lived many ups and downs during that time. And it is wonderful to stand here at a high point for our government, but a most challenging point for the nation uh, as you move into the next phase of your life. Our journey through the days in opposition, where yes, there were there times where we would uh, tag team speaking along with uh, a number of others, much to Senator Wong and others' consternation for sometimes many hours on end. We would rail against the ruthless exercise of the guillotine by Senator Wong and other Labor ministers at the time. But as Senator Cormann reflected, we learnt a few lessons along the way about when and how to do so. We moved into government. Uh, you uh, straight into the cabinet uh, as the finance minister for our whole duration of, uh, of our time uh, in government. and uh, That is a remarkable achievement by you and will be deeply felt uh, by the government in terms of you 
leaving that role and that loss of continuity. I, in many roles, have fronted up to the ERC to be bounced out with a Matthias Cormann no. <laughs> Go back and sharpen up the pencil for something that comes at lower cost. And again, just as we learnt some tactics from Senator Wong in opposition, colleagues, hopefully I've learnt some tactics from Senator Cormann to take into those ERC conversations. So Rosemary, I know you hope that I have too. In a leadership context, you have managed to negotiate, indeed, uh, the coalition, each of our parties, with our points of difference at times, and to show respect to those points of difference, but to also hopefully bring us to points of unity. And it is on that front that I hope we can continue to all work together in the same vein. Both yourself and Senator Wong have spoken some fine words about how this chamber, this parliament, this place best works. And that's not to say that we aren't uh, a robust democracy. We must be a robust democracy. That is absolutely how it best works. But it is also the case that we should all be mindful of the way in which we engage in that robust activity. Uh, and I think you have both brought out the best in the debate today in doing so. I add my thanks to Hayley and my best wishes to Hayley, Charlotte and Isabel in terms of the future ahead. I, of course, am not hoping that they have quite as much time as some have reflected um, of your freedom, because uh, I hope, from a portfolio perspective that I currently hold, uh, that we enjoy the success of your candidacy uh, for the Secretary-General of the OECD, and that that leads to a new but equally busy life, a different one, uh, but a life indeed where you will make different contributions uh, still bringing, though, the same drive, uh, the values uh, that help not just our country and our economy, uh, but countries and economies across the globe to succeed in the future. You're the right man for that job. You've been the right man for the jobs you have served in this place, and for that we thank you. Senator Patrick. Uh, Mr President, uh, uh, Senator Cormann, I will be uh, one person who is very sad to see you go. I think you're a huge loss to the government. Uh, you've, you uh, play the role as leader of the government in the Senate, uh, as the finance minister, but also as the crossbench whisperer. And uh, it's from that perspective I'm going to talk briefly about my experiences with you. My experience with you started actually. <laughs> my experience with you started actually not as a senator, but as a as, a, as an advisor to Nick Xenophon, uh, and I was involved in a negotiation on. Uh, Clause 4.7 of the Commonwealth Procurement Rules. And uh, when I first walked into your office, office, even as a staffer, you were very respectful of, of me. And, uh, and we've heard that word being used a lot uh, throughout the, the words that have been spoken today. Um, I then, when I became a senator, my first day as a senator, I thought, I'm going to take this bloke on. Right? So, I, so my, fir my first question without notice, and I've got it here. Um, uh, the, 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 the third supplementary. I said, Minister, you are the crossbench whisperer, whisperer, the deal maker. What effect do you think this breach of agreement with NXT will have on future crossbench negotiations? <laughs> now, no, and, and you can see how he's responding then. And I will, I will eventually come back to that. But, but that's, that's the point in which I worked out what Matthias's greatest weakness was, but also his greatest strength. And that was he cares about relationships. And that, in my view, has been his success in this place, uh, because he, he has maintained relationships uh, with, with everyone. Um, in your role as the crossbench whisperer, um, we haven't always agreed. There's been times when uh, you've annoyed me. There's been times when I've annoyed you. And there's been times when I've really annoyed you. Um, <laughs> but, it's, but, it, but it's fair to say that always, always, always you were professional. We've always had a very professional relationship. Um, one of the things that impressed me most about you, and, and I'm a crossbencher who has to deal with lots and lots of bits of legislation uh, uh, as well as all of the other tasks, you are always across your brief. You are very impressive in that regard. When we negotiate, uh, you've always been respectful. 
things that were done in, in confidence were always held confidential, even at the point of disagreeing about things. I could always trust you and I could always trust you in delivery. You were always available. Uh, Senator Cash talked about a 12, a 12 uh, 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 midnight uh, text. I remember one time having a meeting with, uh, with Senator Cormann in, uh, in Melbourne. Uh, actually, it was a dinner meeting. We had a dinner meeting to resolve uh, uh, an issue uh, to do with shipbuilding. And I won't say much more than this. Uh, in, in 30 years' time, maybe, uh, maybe someone will write about it. But we had, a, we had a dinner. I went back to my cheap hotel. He was staying in a more expensive hotel. And uh, uh, at 4 a.m. I woke up and I thought, maybe I've got a solution uh, to this. And I sent him a text saying, are you awake? And of course he comes back, of course, you know, of course he was awake. I said, well, if you can organise coffee in your hotel, um, uh, I'll be there at 5 a.m. And uh, we met and we, we resolved something and, and in many years' time we can perhaps talk about that. But, uh, but uh, uh, a good outcome for Australia, I might add. So, um, uh, the only time you really came close to sort of breaching uh, uh, tr trust in me was the was the time where you poached my senior advisor, uh, Jono, who's uh, probably still around there. He's up up in the gallery. He is a great man, and and, and the funny thing was, the funny thing was, um, I knew that he was he was going to go to a, a better position you know, uh, from a career perspective. But I sent you a text and I said, uh, it went something along the lines, uh, do you realise that Jono is the only one in my office that keeps me rational? <laughs> and, and quickly, very quickly, uh, because he's always worried about relationships, he called me up and said, Rex, Rex, uh, you know, I, I said to Jono that he couldn't come if you, wouldn't, if you, wouldn't, uh, if you didn't approve. Now, of course I approved because it was a, a career advancement for Jono. But, uh, but again, uh, that, that showed his sensitivity to the relationships. And, and I know John has uh, uh, served you well, and uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe with uh, some help with a letter to the Prime Minister, I'm happy to take him back. Okay, so, but, uh, um, <laughs> yeah, well, the, the, the new crossbench, which is he's already upsetting me. Um, We've always got on well, and I'm, I think there's a real friendship there. And uh, uh, in the end, and I just want to go back to what I what I said, and Mr. President, I'd like to withdraw some of the harsh remarks that I made in that first question on notice, because actually just recently on clause 4.7, you did issue a, a guidance note, which was which makes me much much happier. So I think you've actually finally committed to all the uh, uh, to everything you've ever you've finally fulfilled everything you uh, you committed to. Um, so I withdraw those, uh, those, those remarks I made. Um, the OECD could do with a bloke like you. That's, uh, you know, th that's my advice. Uh, th th they, they could come off with a lot, a lot worse candidates than, than Matthias Cormann. Um, as I said to you at the start, sad to see you go, but can I just say um, you will never completely leave here because, as a transparency extremist that I am, I am going to, on a regular basis, use the 2009 Cormann motion. Okay? <laughs> and others might necessarily know what that means, but that is a, a fantastic motion, and, I'm, uh, and, I, and I thank you for it. Matthias Cormann, good luck. Senator Reynolds. Oh, sorry. Oh. I'm going to go. go. All right, Senator Reynolds, please for WIV. I'll go to Senator Gallagher next. Sorry, I didn't see you standing. Uh, th thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Gallagher, as well. Well, I too stand here to pay tribute to my colleague and friend, Senator Matthias Cormann. Uh, Matthias, like myself, is a very proud West Australian and a very, very passionate Liberal for all of the reasons he and others have articulated so wonderfully in the chamber here today. Uh, but he is a great example of how good is Australia, and he's also a great example, I think, of how good a Liberal he is as well. So, Matthias, um, your time in this place, many people have talked about uh, the enormous contributions you've made as a senator and also as a shadow minister and a minister. But I also would like to share with some of the chamber about 
the great contributions you made also as a staffer uh, prior to that. And our nation does owe you, as has been articulated here, such a great thanks for the work that you have done, particularly in that uh, relentless focus on trajectory uh, during the seven last budgets. And there is no uh, time more than now when that has been so necessary. I'd like to, as I said, take my opportunity just to share a little bit of reflections on Matthias in a little more of a personal sense. Uh, Matthias and I first got to know each other and worked together in 2001 in the office of Senator Chris Ellison, where uh, I was his chief of staff at the time. Chris was a wonderful mentor, uh, as Matthias has said, but he also had, we had a great office at the time. There was Matthias, there was Dean Smith, um, there was Christian Porter and many others. And all of us do owe Chris a great debt of gratitude uh, for that experience. But on reflection, I think there's a couple of uh, things in that time that has also contributed to Matthias being uh, the man and the minister that he has been. Uh, it was during that time uh, in that office with Chris Ellison during 2001 and 2003 when I was there that shaped not only me going through the Bali bombing, September 11, uh, the uh, issues with uh, the boat arrivals and the, and the deaths. That certainly shaped all of us in that office. We saw the best of humanity and we also saw the absolute worst of humanity. And I know it shaped me in so many ways as I'm sure it uh, contributed to making Matthias, uh, as I said, who he is. That respect for human dignity, um, it, you know, the quality before the law, and also just understanding the need in this job for great compassion, but also for great strength, uh, and particularly in, in national security. And I've got to say, over the last 18 months, being on the National Security Committee of Cabinet, again seeing Matthias's very steady hand, and very wise guidance uh, on that committee, not only dealing with issues, uh, significant issues of national security, but also that firm hand through COVID-19 and through the bushfire season. Uh, Matthias, uh, given the nature of those deliberations, nobody, there's only a small handful of us who will ever see that, but uh, your contribution to our nation's security as well cannot be underestimated. And there's something else I'd like to also share with you uh, that has given me, uh, you know, some I think, some insights into Matthias. And back in 2001, Chris Ellison brought the, the team together. And Matthias, I think, came to see that almost as a second family. And over the last nearly 20 years, uh, no matter how busy Matthias has been, he has done everything he can to keep that family together. Uh, every year, no matter, as I said, how busy, he brings uh, all the past people who have worked for Chris Ellison together. And as Matthias's family has grown, uh, the Chris Ellison family uh, has continued to be part of uh, Matthias's family. And uh, there is no one who barbecues Belgian sausages better than Matthias Corman, and also nobody who bakes a more impressive uh, cake and uh, birthday cake than Matthias. And again, Matthias, thank you for keeping uh, that team together and thank you for including us in your family's lives and you know, giving us a, a, a first-hand insight into some of the stresses and strains that Hayley uh, and the girls have, have worn in, in your service. So, as I say to our defence families, is their family serve alongside them in service of our nation? And your family has certainly served alongside you and made your contributions to our nation possible. So, like everybody else, I wish you all the best for the next phase of your career. Um, I absolutely hope and I, you will make an outstanding Secretary General to the OECD. And uh, I can tell you the Ellison family will be more than happy to come to you for the next uh, Christmas uh, in <laughs> Europe. So, you are not only, in, in reference to cricket, I think you are the, possibly the finest Belgian batter and bowler that our nation has ever had, Matthias. And good luck, and thank you for everything you've done for all of us. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I just rise to um, add a few contributions um, to um, the um, valedictory for Senator Cormann. Um, I, I rise as shadow finance minister, and um, I've only had that portfolio since May last year. And I, I do have a critique of your performance as finance minister, but perhaps you know there's another time. Not this isn't probably <laughs> the time. 
Yeah, yeah. I think that that sounds pretty reasonable. Um, I think one of uh, your most significant strengths, and I think many others have spoken about this this morning, um, is in politics a lot of people undervalue relationships, and I think that's something it's been obvious to me since I came into the Senate. You've never done, uh, so you're able to build relationships across the chamber, and I think the number of people in here and talking today uh, shows shows how much people have valued that over time. I think it is underrated in politics. Politics is its heart is a very honourable profession. Some of us, you know, some are closer to that than others, <laughs> perhaps. Um, but you know, serving the country, um, serving in a public way, it is an honourable profession, and I think people, we need people who aspire to that. I think you have aspired to that in politics, even though we, I disagree deeply with you on 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 politics itself, on very many aspects of it. I do think that that's important, and I think you've shown that it matters, and I think as a leader that matters because that permeates across uh, the chamber. Um, I think the Senate relationships matter more than most uh, chambers in minority parliaments, um, and without a leader that values them, this would be a much messier place than it is um, at other times. I found you a rather frustrating opponent, and when I try and put my finger on why, I think you know it, it comes back to this: you, you're very capable, um, you know, as a, a less capable, a, a less capable opponent would have been uh, more welcome. Um, <laughs> um, in estimates, I think I went into estimates when I came to this place from government and came into opposition. And I thought I'd be really good at estimates. Um, and I remember you. People have used a cricket analogy. I think Senator Reynolds just did. I think you might have as well. I think I would describe you as a handy all-rounder, really. Um, and I, at estimates, I think I would try everything. I'd try to antagonise you, verbalise you, irritate you, go around you, go to the back of the budget books, go to the front of the budget books, just to find a way. Uh, to penetrate what I saw as an immovable object um, in my way. Um, but you've taught me a lot through that. So when I'm finance minister, um, <laughs> you learnt from Penny, I'm learning from you, <laughs> and beware. Um, I'm going to be fabulous. Um, <laughs> anyway, back to you. Um, in terms of next estimates, and I said this before to you, please feel free not to attend. Uh, that's fine. Um, leave approved. Um, on a personal note, I've, you know, I know that you and Penny have a very um, strong personal friendship, and I, I saw a glimpse of that working in the role I have. But I also too have enjoyed um, some of the WhatsApp messages. Um, you know, the ambit where they start and where we get to in the end is. It's an interesting trail if, if we were ever, <laughs> if that confidence was ever to be portrayed, which it won't be. Um, on a personal level, um, you know, you show in my constitutional interlude, um, as I reflect <laughs> on it, you were very kind to me. It was a, it was a difficult time, and I appreciate that very much. In terms of the transition out, I would, as someone who has left government and left being in the role where you make decisions and make things happen. It isn't as easy as you like to think. You think of all this quiet time and time with the family, which is you know, all very lovely. But there's also a part of you that has to adjust to a role where you don't just pick up the phone and order a range of people to deliver it, you know, to do certain things, or you're able to see a problem and fix it. Um, I think Senator Keneally's probably experienced this. We all have as we transition out of different roles. The caravan moves on very quickly. Um, you know, and I think part of the transitioning out is being kind to yourself, acknowledging that, and that, you know, life's a funny thing. There is always other opportunities, and um, I know, you know, life post politics will be very good for you. And I hope that you get the time with your family uh, that you need in the interim. I think the other thing people, capable people, do is they sign themselves up for so many things. Mm -hmm afterwards that you don't find that right balance. But um, I've enjoyed working with you, Matthias. Um, I'm not going to miss you at estimates. Um, I remember once 
moaning through estimates that we didn't get all your media releases and um, you know, was there a reason why, you know, was there some conspiracy why we were off your email list, we tried to sign up and uh, you assured me there was no issue and you'd, you'd, take, you'd go away and have a look at it and <laughs> I've regretted it ever since <laughs> because I get everything about four times. I mean, they really listen to you and they've signed me up and so now I just get, what has Matias been up to? And some days you're very busy, um, but all the best. Um, I wish you, you and your family very well. Senator Rustin. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Well, how good is Matthias Cormann? Um, you know, and I, the answer is, as I'm sure we all know, he is very, very good. And there are so many things that we could stand here and, and uh, bear testament to why he is so good. But I just thought I'd share with you a couple of reasons why I think Matthias Cormann is so good. I mean, he has the most extraordinary skills at herding cats. Um, as we know, on, uh, on our side, we have a very broad church and he has to keep all of us in the corral. At the same time, he's, uh, he's trying to round up the crossbench and, and all the while still, still seems to be able to keep a very close eye on what's going on on the other side of the chamber for any tactical moves that uh, might bring uh, his strategy of the day unstuck. Um, I think another one of his great skills is he is absolutely relentless. His persistence and and his commitment to uh, to work ethic. Um, you know, this guy doesn't ever leave anything in the tank, as we all know. And um, he will stay on the field. He will stay on the field until the absolute final siren, even when we're losing. In that just tiny little hope that some miracle will occur, and he will actually be able to win. Um, He's also extraordinarily generous, and can I say um, I have been the recipient of your extraordinary generosity in terms of your time um, and the support that you have given to me. I mean, there, you've never ever shied away from uh, spending time with me when I had a problem, showing me uh, the way forward. Uh, and I thank you very much for the, the support that you showed in, uh, in me, and I believe that uh, much of uh, my success in my political career has been down to the fact that you backed me in, um, and you backed me in with those that made the decisions, and so I thank you for um, where I am today. I mean, so much has been said in this chamber about, uh, about Matthias, and I wish to associate myself with, with just about all of those comments, maybe not a few of the ones that we just got from Katie. But, uh, um, you'll certainly be missed in this place. I am certainly going to miss you. Um, I'm even going to miss the WhatsApps at all hours of the day and night. I absolutely, definitely are going to miss the Lewin Estate uh, Chardonnay. Um, but I suppose um, I, the one thing that we all probably should miss, and that is your ruthless honesty. Uh, I'm not sure no an is ever going to be able to be delivered in quite the same way <laughs> that yours has. Um, but look, mate, um, Good luck, my friend. Uh, the next chapter of your life is, I'm sure, going to be just as exciting as the last one. Um, I hope it's at the OECD, but wherever it will be, they're going to be very lucky to have you, you. go well. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr President. On behalf of WA Labor senators, I'd like to uh, wish you, Senator Cormann, all the best for the future. When we first came into this place, your vigour and determination was evident from the outset. We did some community television together, and uh, Senator Cormann's dogged discipline around sticking to the key messages and key lines around uh, the Gillard the government's carbon tax, uh, when uh, you know was in endemically successful. Uh, I'm very sad to say. Um, and it is a discipline that uh, has clearly taken you to great heights in this place, and I thank you uh, for your service to the nation. Uh, marriage equality, the path that you took us on to get us there is not one with which I agreed, but I deeply respect uh, your commitment to getting it resolved uh, and that it's terrific uh, that, that, uh, is, that those rights and privileges uh, are now shared by all Australians, and I thank you for your commitment to resolving that, notwithstanding the fact that a great many of us disappear, uh, di uh, disagreed with the path uh, that you took. Um, I'll miss seeing you uh, down on down at O'Day, as occasionally we'd bump into each other. Me, you wearing a Liberal T-shirt, and we wearing a Socialist Republic of 
Crawley t-shirt kindly supplied by Labor students. Um, I also like to thank you for standing up for WA. The GST resolution uh, is a significant milestone for our state. I thank you for working with the state Labor government and responding to the enormous pressure that the opposition, federal opposition put you under in order to get that resolved. Um, uh, so go well. I look forward to, I hope, seeing you uh, active globally, but I'm sure it will also include bumping into you at a polling booth in the near future. Senator Sir Selger. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Um, it's good to, uh, to associate myself with the very uh, timely and generous remarks of many uh, and to pay tribute to my good friend uh, and colleague Matthias Cormann. Now, Matthias and I, um, uh, we met a number of occasions uh, before I was in uh, this place. I remember meeting uh, Matthias and Haley and having a great night at a Young, young Liberals uh, function uh, where we hit it off quite well. And I think that might have been one of our first meetings. But one of the meetings I remember most uh, before coming into this place, it was around Christmas party 2012 uh, up here, Christmas party celebrations for the opposition as it was uh, then. And I remember being sat down in Matthias's office, uh, and he said to me, "He said to me, he said to me, Zed, you should come join us here. It's very nice." And I, and I thought, well, you know, there's something in that. There's something in that. And uh, I think it was Matthias's encouragement uh, that was a very uh, big part of my decision uh, to come into this place. He did go on to say to me, he said, you know, you're playing in the VFL, you should come play in the <laughs> AFL. And, I, and, and, and I'm glad that I did. Um, I'm more of an NRL man myself, but uh, I think if we were to compare the Senate to the AFL, uh, I think you'd have to acknowledge that over the last few years, uh, Matthias Cormann, uh, for our team, has been our captain coach uh, and very much our best and fairest. And has made an absolutely extraordinary contribution uh, and I think we can't sort of overstate uh, that contribution to the Senate, uh, to our party and to our nation. Uh, I've had the, the great privilege of being Assistant Finance Minister uh, to our greatest uh, ever Finance Minister. It, it's, it's wonderful to be able to learn from the best. Uh, it really is. Um, but can I say that as much as I've been able to learn a lot uh, from Matthias and, and his amazing office uh, and the way he does things, and we've seen others like uh, me and, me and uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, of course, exchange notes on what it's like to work as Assistant Finance Minister, I've got to say the other part about being assistant to Matthias is that uh, it's really quite easy because he absolutely does everything. You know, he, just, he just makes sure he gets it all done, uh, and he does that in the most professional way. Uh, People have talked a lot about his energy uh, and his commitment. I still remember that 30-plus hour debate on Senate voting reform, and uh, you know, words, the words "energise a bunny" come to mind in the way that Matthias stayed in there for the whole time. I think there were a couple of toilet breaks, uh, but aside from that, he was there arguing the case as the opposition were uh, engaging in all sorts of games, and it was just a reflection of how much effort he puts in. I wanted to just have a couple of short reflections briefly before I finish uh, on Matthias as a thought leader. Uh, for the Liberal Party, and might I say particularly uh, for uh, the Conservatives uh, within the Liberal Party as well. Matthias speaks passionately about seeing East and West Berlin and what that meant for his political philosophy, these ideas of freedom, these ideas of personal uh, effort, reward for effort, stretching yourself. He, he, he speaks well and he spoke very well uh, in the speech again today. Uh, but I think also he has some other enduring values uh, about the importance of family, the importance of strong institutions, uh, the, the, the value and worth and dignity of every human life. And, uh, it, is, it, is, it is those things that I think has also made him a thought leader uh, within our movement. And Matthias, you've talked about being now citizen Cormann. Uh, can I say, uh, and I know many of my colleagues will appreciate this, that to us uh, you are and will always be a very solid citizen, Cormann, uh, and we acknowledge that, and I want to acknowledge that uh, on the record. Can I, can I say uh, briefly that I think history will judge uh, you very well, and I think in particular uh, you've had big moments where you've had to make big decisions, uh, and you've been criticised for some of those decisions. Uh, I think unfairly, 
and I think history will judge uh, the fact that you've made uh, the right decisions for our party and the right decisions for our nation. And I'd like the record to reflect that. Uh, just uh, finally, I wanted to pay tribute to Hayley and Isabel and Charlotte. Uh, you know, Hayley is an amazing woman, uh, an absolutely amazing woman, and of course she has uh, borne the burden uh, that you have borne, but in a, in a very different way, in a very significant way. Uh, and she has served our nation uh, in, in being there uh, for you and, as you point out, not just being an amazing wife and mother but going on to an extraordinary career of her own in the meantime. So I want to pay tribute to Hayley uh, and to Isabel and Charlotte and to thank you for lending uh, you to our nation uh, in this capacity for a number of years. We wish you well. Uh, I look forward to seeing uh, your future endeavours and uh, certainly I believe Paris will not know what hit, hit them. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And, uh, I too would like to make a short contribution to the valedictory for Senator Cormann, Matthias. Um, I think it's important to associate myself with remarks across the chamber. Um, it's Matthias's strength of character, which is one of the things that's brought out the best in this place. There's not too many occasions where we all come together and we agree on something in the way that we have today. Uh, but Matisse's strength of character, his relationships across the chamber uh, are one of those moments where it is the best of this place, where we all uh, acknowledge the contribution that uh, Matisse has made. Uh, he made a point in his speech about the philosophy, what he believed in and why, uh, and that's carried him, him all the way through his time here. I sincerely hope that the rest of the world gets the opportunity to have the benefit of that uh, through the OECD. I really do wish you the very best in that quest, Matthias, your philosophy and particularly your character, mm. particularly your character which has been demonstrated by the comments that have been made around the chamber today um, will be of enormous benefit. Um, I can retire. I think, a newspaper clipping from the Mercury in 1981 where a former Senator Bob Brown was extolling the virtue of building coal-fired power stations in the Fingal Valley when he was campaigning against renewable hydroelectricity in Tasmania. Um, I, I think that can be t retired back to my office rather than being maintained here in the drawer in the chamber. Um, I'm not, I couldn't count the number of times that I handed that to Matthias when he was responding to, an, uh, to a, uh, a question uh, from our friends in the Greens. Uh, Mr President, the acknowledgement of his respect for this institution I think is a really important point. Uh, and, and I acknowledge the comments that Senator Wong made in that respect. Uh, this is an important chamber, it's an important institution. Um, and, and it, it deserves all our respect. It's very easy for us to get caught up in the hurly-burly of the contest across the chamber, but we all should remember uh, what this institution is about and the importance of it. And uh, I, I, I acknowledge the comments that Senator Wong made with respect to the boundaries that we should all place in that sense. It's a really important sentiment. Uh, and um, one sh we should remember. I too have felt the brunt of uh, Senator Cormann at ERC, as so many on our side have, and the philosophy that he brings. Uh, but it is a really important discipline for us all going in there when we're seeking resources, taxpayers' funds, taxpayers' resources uh, that we might want to expend. Uh, and he always had. Uh, a very strong and sound argument to back up his thoughts. He's been an extraordinarily strong counsel for so many of us in this place. Uh, and I would say, in the context of his leadership of the government in the Senate, um, uh, an extraordinarily strong shepherd in keeping the coalition working together um, and maintaining all of us where we needed to be. Uh, and in the circumstances where some of us not, might not have been where we needed to be to make sure that we got there quickly. Uh, Mr President, it's probably a—it's something senators would understand, but I would regard Matthias 
Senator Cormann as a senator's senator. And the fact that he's going out on estimates is probably the best demonstration of that. Um, senator Gallagher might like to see him go earlier, uh, but we're very pleased that, in, in, in a generous way, I'm happy to acknowledge that, Senator Gallagher. Um, but the fact that Matthias is going out on estimates demonstrates that he, that he is a senator's senator. People in this chamber understand that context, I think. Um, uh, he, he acknowledged the work that he did with now Prime Minister Morrison with respect to GST. I know that my state, our sta home state, Tasmania, played a very uh, robust role in that. But the outcome that was achieved as a part of that process, as you acknowledged in your uh, valedictory speech, uh, it is an important one because it was an important one for uh, the country. So I, I would like to acknowledge that. Um, as has been acknowledged across the chamber, he is a senator who got things done, a minister who got things done. Uh, we all have a time here. Matthias has acknowledged and understood his time, but using your time in this place effectively is a really important thing for us all to remember because we all do have our time. Uh, he has done that and he has got things done, which is, I think, really important. Uh, he's going to be a huge loss to our side of politics. I think he'll be a huge loss to the chamber. Um, but, I, but I do hope that he's uh, a gain for the global uh, finance organisation of the OECD. I really do hope that we wish you success on that. But of course, um, as we all know, life is what happens to you while you're planning to do something next. So whatever it is that happens next for you and your family, Matthias, uh, all the very, very best. Uh, thank you for your service to this chamber and to the country. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. President. Mm. We have uh, many privileges as uh, senators, and one of those is to watch uh, at close proximity um, events that shape the government, events that shape our country. Uh, today is one of those events. It's an important day, sad day, important day for the Senate chamber. It's an important day for this coalition government. It's a very, very important day for Western Australia. And we can't underestimate, so we can't overstate just how significant uh, this is. As someone who is uh, very, very keen on the history of our parties, Bridget, someone who's very keen on the history of this Senate chamber in our country, uh, I suggest that there's been no more significant event in the life of this coalition government than the departure of our friend, Matthias Cormann. We are all saddened uh, for our loss, but excited for Matthias and Hayley and the girls. Not the end, but the beginning of a bright, new and exciting chapter for Matthias, and we send him with our best wishes. As we know, one of Matthias' greatest joys is when a plan comes together. Um, Matthias and I have known each other a long time. I first met Matthias uh, shortly after his arrival in Australia. Matthias and I have worked on some very big plans together uh, and they've been very visible. We've also worked on a few invisible plans. And uh, again, that speaks to his character, that Matthias's word is something that you can rely on, is something that you can bank. We thank you very, very much for the way you have led this team. It's been a great honour, and I thank you very personally for the trust that you put in me to be uh, the Chief Government Whip uh, under your leadership. It's been a pleasure to do so. Colleagues, um, we will be able to say, we will be able to say, others that come after today won't be able to say that we worked with that senator, Senator Matthias Cormann. Uh, we knew him, uh, that he knew us. That is the greatest of privileges. Senator Dunham. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Well, great snakes is a phrase oft used by uh, Senator Cormann's animated hero, uh, Tintin, and it is a phrase that came to mind Bravo. when uh, <laughs> Captain Haddock off the movie. Yeah, I've got a Captain Haddock coming up. Yeah. <laughs> But it was a phrase that came to mind when we did learn the news that uh, Senator Cormann would be leaving us. And um, of course, the question that came to mind for me was, whatever will we do? And in reflecting on that question, I thought about the contribution that Senator Cormann, as leader in this place and as someone who has had several significant roles, both in opposition and in government for the coalition over a long time, has made. And the biggest one, as a relative, I mean, I've been here a bit over four years now and still a relatively young member of our team, uh, is the mentoring and the nurturing uh, and the shepherding, as I think Senator Colbeck referred to it as um, before, of younger members of our team, uh, bringing us in, helping us to understand how we can effectively advocate for our communities, for our beliefs within the party room. Uh, and uh, for good outcomes and to, uh, as Senator Smith uh, rightly said, find ways to bring plans together and um, actually get some good outcomes for the people we represent. And so I just briefly want to say to Senator Cormann that, um, you know, he, in his remarks said that he feels some comfort in leaving here. Uh, that, and I think there is good reason for that. That mentoring that he has, the investment he has made in uh, other members in this place, the members of his team, uh, leaves behind a great team and an amazing legacy um, that this country will benefit from for generations to come. So hopefully I can get this Tintin quote right. Um, as Red Rackham said to Sir Francis Haddock, we will meet again in another time. I wish you and your family well and thank you. For <laughs> <laughs> two out of two ain't bad, but thank you, Senator Coleman. <laughs> Senator O'Sullivan. <laughs> Very well. Very well done. It was in, it was in French. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. I'll keep my remarks uh, brief. Uh, um, Matthias Cormann, I'm here today um, because of your support. Um, there's, no, there's no exaggeration. Uh, you uh, have mentored me, you've shown me. Um, you've, you've guided me through the process, both through uh, pre-selection, uh, through uh, you know, what, what it takes to uh, serve the party, uh, to position yourself, and then now here uh, as the newest West Australian senator from the Liberal Party here, uh, I'm, I'm here because of, uh, very much because of your support, and I'm very, very grateful for it. Uh, there's a quality that uh, some have mentioned here already that uh, I just want to echo, and that's that uh, quality that you have of generosity. Um, you've given so much to all of us, you've given so much to me, and the, the true mark of generosity is when you, you do that without any expectation of anything in return, and that's, that's what you've shown. Um, and I just want to uh, put on record my sincere thanks to you. Uh, to Hayley as well. Hayley has been an incredible encouragement to me. In, in my journey in getting here and, uh, and even being here and supporting. Uh, it, it, you know, she's an amazing woman, amazing woman, and she's a, such a, an encouragement. You, know, you spend any time with Hayley, you leave just feeling encouraged. Uh, and your family is, is, is beautiful. And for, for my wife uh, and, and I, uh, we, we look to you guys. We look at seeing how you manage the, the busyness of life and this job, uh, yet still maintain a, a very strong and, and beautiful relationship and as a father to your children, we, we get to see it. We're, those in WA are a little closer and we get to see the, the impact that you have on your children and, and the beautiful way that you as a father, even though you, the pressures have been on you to, um, uh, to, to provide that, that amazing support to them and I think it, it's a real testament to your quality and your character. Uh, can I also just say you know, on behalf of, um, for, you know, for the Liberal Party in Western Australia, the way that you have uh, helped shepherd and, and, uh, and provide leadership within the, the WA Liberal Party. It's, uh, it, it's phenomenal. Uh, it, it's, uh, you're going to be uh, significantly missed in that. Um, uh, I hope we don't completely see you disappear uh, in terms of the, the uh, not leaving the party. That's good. <laughs> um, uh, Matthias, uh, we, we're a very strong division 
and uh, it's, it's tribute to you and, and there's many others that have contributed to that, but I think it would be hard to find anyone that has had such an impact upon the WA Liberal Party and, and you know, on behalf of other uh, Liberal Party members and, in fact, those that are back home. Uh, we've got a state election coming up and there's so many candidates that you know, I think would all love the opportunity to be able to stand here like this today and just say thank you for what you've done. The, the great organisation that we have back there is in very much a, uh, a tribute to you and, uh, and I thank you very much indeed. So I'll go to a couple of senators remotely. I'll start with Senator Brockman. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, it's truly an honour to be able to make a contribution on the departure of my good friend and up until now, seemingly perennial boss, Matthias Gorman. Uh, seven and a half years as a staffer and three years in the Senate with Matthias as Senate leader. What can I say but free at last, free at last. Uh, when I first went to work for Matthias, I was only going to be there for a year or two. But the things we all know about Matthias, the fine mind, the extraordinary work ethic, the ability to understand both the policy and politics uh, of an issue kept me there and in the end helped bring me into the Senate. Opposition was tough, but Matthias made absolutely the most of it. Uh, forensic use of orders for the production of documents, the changes to the public interest immunity claims, which Senator Patrick spoke about. Uh, a number of committee reports that changed the public debate on issues. Uh, these, this demonstration and proved level of achievement improved our public life and improved the Senate. But in my time as Matthias' senior staffer, I'd often get the question, well, what's it like with raised eyebrows? What's he like to work for? And I'd never say it was the easiest of jobs, but it was extraordinarily rewarding. Uh, Matthias's attention to detail was and is legendary, but beyond, beyond the level of, of mere mortals such as myself, uh, the standards he set for himself were incredibly demanding. Uh, the middle of the night uh, Sky News slots, uh, West Australian time that is, are legendary. Uh, Less well known are the draft committee reports, hundreds of pages long, that were his holiday reading. Uh, but Matthias was also very conscious of the impact of the life we led on family and was always unhesitating in being as flexible as possible to make the demands, at least on his staff, uh, more manageable. I'm not sure you always allowed yourself that leeway, Matthias. But certainly from a staffing point of view, you were extraordinarily generous. Uh, I will add uh, my thanks and acknowledgement to Matthias's staff, many of whom I worked with, uh, in particular Natasha Lobo, who's been there from the beginning. But exceptional people like Philippa Campbell, uh, Daniel Clode, Chris Brown, uh, Karen Wu and so many others. The fact that Matthias attracted and retained such exceptional people says a lot about Matthias as a boss, but also Matthias as a man. Matthias is trustworthy and honourable. He has been in a position where he's had to take the hard decisions. And the thing that I most admire about you, Matthias, is that you have never shirked that responsibility. Uh, you're not one to dwell on the past, but history will record that bravery well. Now, the accolades Matthias receives as Australia's longest serving finance minister, uh, and in my possibly biased opinion, the finest and without doubt the most influential finance minister are well earned. Uh, as Matthias has said many times, no one's indispensable to the team. But Matthias, you will be sorely missed. You have been a loyal boss, a good friend and a very supportive colleague. You are a wonderful servant to the Conservative cause, to our great Liberal Party, to Western Australia, to our nation. I already described in my first speech how uh, Matthias's advice led me to meeting Rebecca, so I won't repeat that today. Suffice it to say that your ongoing advice 
will be all, always highly valued by me and by so many of our colleagues. From Rebecca and my family, to you, to Hayley, to Isabel and Charlotte, all the best for whatever the future holds. Senator Kitching remotely. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to add my voice to the valedictory speeches for Senator Cormann. I first spoke with Senator Cormann at estimates, but really after a Remembrance Day event in Canberra in 2017, where Senator Cormann spoke movingly about the consequences of the First World War for his country of birth, Belgium. It was obvious to anyone who heard that speech the understanding Senator Cormann has of the human condition. But it was really after a rather inflammatory tweet of mine, I hasten to add, when Senator Cormann phoned to ask if he could speak with me about it. I have to say, it is not often my experience, Mr. President, that my Twitter leads to the making of a new friend. Often have we met to have a glass of West Australian wine or two, and or champagne, and occasionally some corn chips as well. But this is the measure of Senator Cormann. I think not only in recent days where people have said deservedly kind things, but even from before I came to this place, I heard from senators from all sides and also from members of the Liberal Party who said good things about Senator Cormann. He is someone who deals with people as he finds them, someone who is generous with people. He is, he is someone who has both the characteristics of that other famous Belgian, Tintin, his morality and his authenticity, and also Asterix the Gaul, who is renowned for his shrewd intelligence and his bravery. And I know Senator Cormann is very familiar with both of these characters. And similarly, we both read Asterix in Latin as part of the fun part of studying that language at school. I know that recently Senator Cormann's office purchased, purchased him some Tintin themed masks. And could I turn to Senator Cormann's office? Wise people in this building have told me that parliamentarians' offices often reflect the parliamentarian. Senator Cormann's staff members are professional, happy, and always gracious to odd visitors to their office. And I thank them for that and for always making me feel welcome. We know from his own valedictory speech a short time ago, the regard that Senator Cormann has to history and to philosophy and to the greatness of democracy. We know that in this place, it is not the people who are vibrant with passion for how Australia can be a better place who are unwanted, but rather those who cease to care. The people in this place who are engaged, who do care, who are willing to have the argument, both in the chamber and outside, but who do that with respect, who can find common ground. For all of those people, Senator Cormann is an exemplar and his kindness and his compassion about his fellow human beings is at the forefront. Australia has been very lucky to have you in this place and your family has been very generous in that regard. And the OECD would be very lucky to have you as the Secretary General. But wherever life takes you, you will always have your excellent character and your sense of humour. So it's not adieu, but rather bonne chance pour la suite et à bientôt. Thank you, Mr. President. I will take the opportunity to briefly conclude <laughs> the debate. I promise to be brief. I'm not going to repeat everything everyone has said, but tell a few anecdotes that illustrate the points that everyone has made, the common themes that have been mentioned here this afternoon. But personally, I think we should all acknowledge, and particularly those of us from the East, that the burden people carry coming from the West to play an active role in public life in Australia and by their families is truly extraordinary. Uh, when you combine that with the work ethic that others have spoken about with Matthias, the burden upon him, but also Hayley and the girls and those others close to him, um, has been extraordinary. It is so much tougher because of the time differences and the sheer number of hours on planes. Um, Matthias's work ethic was demonstrated in many ways, but in my case, when I was ill, he had to step into my portfolio. And all I remember my staff telling me when I came back to work was it was fantastic because at 11 o'clock at night, um, on a Thursday night, when he got off the plane in Perth, their phones didn't light up with all the WhatsApp messages and emails that had been prepared on the plane on the way over, because every single minute was a minute um, to take advantage of for his purpose in public life. When I sat in 
on ERC for a couple of years, I, he, Matthias, his command of detail without meaning to begrudge anyone else was truly extraordinary. And the size of those folders and the breadth of government activity um, was very difficult for any person to get across, but Matthias did. Um, I do think I hold the record for the only spending minister to come into ERC, though, and when having a program cut, offered up more uh, and said you can have the whole program. Um, it was the only time I think I saw Matthias a stone visage at, at, at ERC crack. He hadn't had that happen before. Um, without meaning to be flippant, you know, someone else might have claimed the title, but Matthias was the fixer of the government because the fixing of the government actually has to happen in this chamber. This is where announcements in the other place, down at the other end of this building, get turned into law, where public resources get determined whether they're tax cuts or spending programs. If you can't make this chamber work, you can't make the Australian parliament work. And everyone has an experience of that. Uh, Matthias would ha happily prosecute a collective decision and he did not take differences personally. I had my share of differences. Life would be boring if we didn't, on our own side or on the other side. But Matthias always had the ability to go on with a collective decision that was taken with a common purpose. In the end, um, I would say that he held himself to the standards he expected of others. And that is really um, one thing we can all aspire to and share. So, um, Matthias, congratulations um, to your family. Very best wishes to you professionally, very, very best wishes and farewell for the last time from the chamber, if not from the work of the Senate over the next few weeks. Um, I now say, um, pursuant to order, the Senate will now adjourn without debate. I remind senators that legislation committees will meet to consider estimates commencing on Monday the 19th of October at 9 a.m. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again on Monday the 9th of November at 10 a.m.